So welcome, my name is Jason Williams and I'm an assistant director here at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory DNA Learning Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our Meet a Scientist series uh, where we're uh, very privileged to have a special guest today and I will introduce her in just a moment. Um, before I do that, I do wanna share a little bit of information um, just so that everybody uh, knows what's going on. So I'm gonna share my screen just for a second. Um, it, if you've come to uh, us, you probably have been to the Cold Spring Harbor Learning, uh, DNA Learning Center's website. And uh, one of the more important pieces of news is that our summer camps are open. Uh, and so if we know that during this past year, your opportunity to do hands-on science has been limited. Uh, and so um, we are planning to have in-person camps as well as virtual this summer. So if you're at all interested in that, please take a look at that um, you'll find it on our website and you can find out how you can participate. We also have a number of other programs. So there are field trips going on that uh, people can visit us that way still. But we also have some spring break um, programs and also AP bio programs. Uh, all of these things are going on. So take a look at the website. Also, you might have been to our Meet a Scientist series website previously and you can see um, both some of our past speakers that you might be interested in and also um, upcoming speakers. So we have Alexa next, but today uh, we are privileged to have Miriam uh, Ferreira Gonzalez and she's going to be talking about cancer. So let me uh, just uh, add her here. We're gonna be talking with uh, Miriam in just a moment. So welcome Miriam. And let me just quickly uh, tell you how you can ask questions. So if possible, we'd like you to go ahead and ask questions using the Q&A button um, that's down, should be at the bottom of your screen. That way we can see every question and sort of make sure that we do that. So it's a little bit more manageable than the chat. And um, Miriam has said that if you do have questions during her talk, uh, she's, she's willing to answer them. So you don't have to wait at the end, but at the end, we will definitely leave a time for questions because we're trying to keep this to about a half hour uh, so it's not too long, but still very, very interesting. And we get to hear about some of the things that Miriam does. So please um, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Miriam, who's going to introduce herself and is going to talk to us about whole body response to cancer. So uh, thank you very much, Miriam. And I'll see you on the other side. Hi, hello everyone. Um, thanks Jason for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and as Jason said, I'm Miriam Ferrer Gonzalez. I'm currently a third year PhD student here in the Gold Spring Carbo Lab. And I'm gonna talk a bit about how I became a scientist, why did I choose becoming a scientist and how I ended up here in Gold Spring Carbo Lab. Um, let me just share my screen. I hope everyone can, can see my screen. Um, so I, as I said, I'm currently a third year PhD student in the Janowitz lab here in Cold Spring Harbor. And the research of the lab is mainly focused on the whole body response to cancer. So not just single organ and how a single organ is affected by cancer, but the whole body response. Um, just as an introduction, who am I and, and where do I come from? So I'm a PhD student here but also officially involved in Cambridge in the UK because um, I met my current PI there in the UK, Tobias Janowitz um, was there and then he invited me to come as a PhD student here and we set up a sort of program in which I am half in the UK, half here in Cold Spring Harbor. So I'm very lucky to, to be in different places and, and, and doing this project and doing this period of PhD. Before that, I was a uh, master's student in the University of Cambridge where I, I got the chance to meet my Tobias Janowitz, as I said, my PI. And before that, I did my undergrad in Spain. Um, it was a, an undergrad in biomedical research um, in my hometown. But for me, the most important period of time for my early career in science um, was um, the time that happened in between my undergrad and my master's research because I, I got to visit different labs. I, I did internships in different labs, not only in my home country, Spain, but outside of Spain and in Europe and then here. 
and by trying different research areas and, and working in different research topics, seeing how different the structure in a lab can be, um, I, I really discovered what I wanted to do, what I wanted to focus my, my research on. Um, so I come from Lleida, which is a city in, uh, in Spain, is part of Catalonia and Catalonia has four main capitals and I, I was born in the only one that has no coast, no sea. So I really appreciate being surrounded by sea now here on, on the Gospin Harbor campus. Um, my hometown has a very, very, very nice pretty castle, but it's not really well known for its science. And unfortunately, there is not much um, research institutions in there. So I wasn't exposed to much uh, science or scientific research um, while I was growing up. Also, my, my family doesn't come from scientific background. My parents didn't get the chance to go to university. So it was a whole new world that I, I it took me a while and I discovered um, throughout the years. Um, what's traditional from my home country? So there's this very interesting um, tradition in which people build human towers. It's a really team building sport um, that currently it's not, it's not being um, performed um, due to the pandemic, but it's really, it's really nice to see how people work together um, to make these human towers. And that's how I, I think of science as well, of people working together. Um, and just another interesting tradition that we have um, in my hometown is this um, one day in the year in which we celebrate by eating snails. There's this like snail holiday in which everyone eats snails because my, my hometown is really known for its good quality um, way of cooking snails. Um, so that's, that's how I was, I was during my early years of life how I, while I was growing up. Um, and then I went to university. Um, I went to university in my hometown, the University of Lleida, and I studied um, biomedicine. It was a biomedical degree. Um, it was uh, throughout four years, and what it had, it had a really good thing, and that was that I was given the opportunity to rotate each year in a different lab as part of of my of my studies. Um, I rotated throughout three months in different labs. So I got research experience in four different labs in, in Lleida outside of, of my region and, and in Europe. The first lab I worked in is the lab from Dr. Reynal Pamplona. His lab is focused on metabolism and oxidative stress, stress not only in aging, but also in, in various pathologies. Um, most importantly, um, neurobiology um, associated pathologies. I don't know if you guys know what oxidative stress is, but it consists in the production of these highly reactive molecules that are very toxic and they can react with DNA, with RNA, with proteins, and therefore they, they can lead to mutations and are very harmful to the body. And so in, in the period I spent in his lab, we we're working on how to prevent those and where do they come from, et cetera. And interestingly, some of these molecules are constantly being produced by metabolism, by the food we eat. Um, for example, lipids, the um, metabolism of lipids leads to the production of some specific molecules that are very, very reactive. And a healthy body is able to detoxify and get rid, get rid of those molecules um, but of course it can get overwhelmed and saturated um, and that leads to pathology. So that was a very interesting rotation I did there. And uh, I moved on from oxidative stress and metabolism because I wanted to explore something more related to neuroscience and neuropathology. And the, the, during my following rotation, I went into the lab of Dr. Dolado um, in the South of Spain. And there, uh, his lab is focused on stem cell research and how to apply stem cells into um, curing different pathologies, mainly um, neuropathologies. I don't know um, if you've ever heard of what a stem cell is. It's mainly one of the early on cells that still hasn't differentiated and hasn't decided to, if, if it's gonna become a fat cell, a bone cell, or a blood cell. So it's a, 
it's a very early in developmental in development cell that can either divide itself many times and keep giving more and more stem cells um, or differentiate in any of the cell types that we have in our body. Therefore, that's, uh, they have a huge potential for, for treatment since we can induce these stem cells to become any of the cells we, we want them to be. Um, and then, for example, are not functioning properly um, in some type of diseases. So it's really, it's really, um, it has really a lot of potential to work with stem cells. And in, while I was doing this rotation in Dr. Delado's lab, I really enjoyed studying neuroscience and the nervous system. I, I really found that that was really interesting and that we could make, we could make a difference in, in humans. My next rotation, I moved out from my home, my home country. I left Spain and then I went to Germany to Heidelberg, a very, very nice um, town in Germany. And in, I was there in the lab of Professor Ruiz Albodovar. Um, she uh, tries to link how the nervous system and the blood system um, can be similar or can be different and can work together. Um, so they, they seem to be complete different systems in the body, but they are more similar than one would um, expect. For example, um, a growing blood vessel at the, at the tip of a growing blood vessel, there's an endothelial cell that has a very specific function that it consists in sensing the cues of the environment and sensing how the environment is, is looking like to see and decide where to move to, which direction does the blood vessel have to go to. And in pink, I'm, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor. Um, these are blood vessel stainings that show blood vessels growing right now. Um, this uh, is from a sample in which um, blood vessels are growing. And in green, you can see the neurons. But what's interesting is that um, a neuron, um, a neuronal cell that has these projection, projections that are axons at the tip, there's also a um, um, structure that is called no, um, growth cone that's also in charge of sensing the cues of the environment and leading and guiding this axon to um, project in the, in the brain or any other region in the nervous system. And that happens in development. And interestingly, many of the cues are shared in between systems. So there's some cues like, for example, BH, BHP, BEGF, that guides both the nervous system and the blood vessels system. Um, in there, uh, in doing my rotation in this lab, I really got into knowing which techniques to use, which stainings are appropriate, what, how, do I, how do I see a neuron, which markers do I see, um, why, how I detect a blood vessels in a, in a sample. Um, so it was really, really productive for me. Um, after that, I had to graduate from my, my undergrad in Spain, so I went back to Spain. I, did, I, I worked in a final degree project um, that I then presented to be able to, to get my, my degree. And during this last uh, rotation, I worked in stroke research. Um, stroke um, happens when the blood flow to some areas in the brain is stopped. Um, there's no blood going into some regions of the brain, so that stops the, the um, input and new nutrients and leads to cell death. The most common cause of, of stroke is ischemic stroke, which is a type of stroke that is caused by blockage of blood vessels due to fatty accumulation or blood clot. So the blood flow is stopped and then that leads to cell death in the brain and therefore it's, um, it's quite dramatic for, for patients because they lose function of those areas in the brain. Um, and in, during the time I spent there, we were working together to find a biomarker, which is a molecule that can uh, tell us what's going on, what's going to happen. And we were looking for biomarkers to prevent and predict which people are more sensitive or are more likely to have a stroke in the future. Um, and during these very long, uh, well, very long, longer than the other internships I did, I found that this is what I really liked. I liked being able to find 
to look for something, to um, aim to find something that would then change the life of patients. Because imagine finding a, a, a molecule that you can then measure in, in people's blood and that can tell you this person um, is more likely or less likely to have a stroke or to um, improve diagnosis and more rapidly say, this is the type of problem this person has. So that really motivated me. Um, we're looking for something and trying to make a difference in people's lives. Um, so next, I graduated and wanted to go into this more translational angle. No, not just doing something on my bench in the lab that um, I didn't have any motivation for, um, but really for how to translate that into patients, into into people that are in a hospital that are sick. Um, so that's why I applied for a, for a, for the master's in translational bi biomedical research in, in the UK. And I went into the University of Cambridge. As part of the, of the master's degree there, we had to do a rotation in a lab. And at the beginning, I wanted to keep working for working in neuroscience and and stroke research was something that I really um, enjoyed in the past. So I was looking for labs, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really convinced. And then I met Tobias Janowitz, assistant professor Janowitz now here in Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And his point of view and his, the, his way of looking at research on how, how to approach research is what really made me go into cancer research, which is what I'm doing now with uh, Tobias Janowitz in his lab. Um, so his perspective is not just only of an organ in the body being affected by rapidly dividing cancer cells that therefore damage that organ and, 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 uh, and cause an impairment in, in someone that has the cancer. But it, it, he believes in a more host response and whole body response in the whole body being affected by cancer, which is um, really, really something that is very important to focus and to, to research on because the tumor is, is just, is happening in a specific part of the body, but it's not just there. Um, the brain is affected by it. The immune system is affected by it. digestion, um, hormones. It's, it really changes how the whole body works. Um, and this idea, this not just only looking at cancer and the tumor itself, is what uh, made me rotate in his lab. And then when he offered me to come and become a PhD student here, as he started his own lab here, I really said, yes, why not? Um, so I moved to the US. Um, and uh, we then started our research here um, as a lab, we are now, around eight people in the lab. So he's been here for around three years now and the lab is, is, is very nice. Um, I really appreciate being in, in, in his lab. And we are uh, start a specific um, syndrome that is associated with cancer um, and that's cancer associated cachexia. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but cancer associated cachexia is an end stage um, wasting syndrome that happens in, in different cancer types. For example, pancreatic pe people with pancreatic cancer are affected by it, um, colorectal cancer patients as well. And um, it's a very rapid loss of body weight mass, um, as well with the loss of fat tissue, muscle tissue. But not only that, um, patients keep losing weight, but they don't feel hungry. They stop eating despite, you know, that goes against survival, but they just, they are not hungry. They are not motivated. So um, it's a syndrome that it seems to be affected, not affecting not just the body, but it changes people's um, motivation, um, hunger. So that's just an example of how cancer can affect the whole body. Um, and these are just of the symptoms I've mentioned that happen um, during cachexia and unfortunately is associated with um, the high um, rate of death. 
And uh, in Tobias Janovitz's laboratory, we are looking at this, um, at cancer in this perspective, the host perspective in which the tumor interacts not, on, not only the organ is affecting, the, the organ that is affected, but the endocrine system, the liver, fat tissue, muscle tissue, etc. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of the research um, in this lab. So, for example, um, how the liver is affected. As I said, um, patients with cancer-associated cachexia, they, they stop eating because they don't feel hungry. And so if someone is losing weight and someone is not eating in a healthy context, someone who is healthy and is losing weight and not eating, there is a metabolic pathway in everyone's body that produces ketones. Ketones are used as fuel in case there's no glucose, which is the main energy, um, the main um, source of energy we use. Um, but in the context of lack of glucose, because we are not eating, um, then we use ketones. And that ketogenic pathway, the production of ketones is mainly lead, uh, led by, by the liver. The liver is in charge of producing those ketones in the context of caloric rest restriction. And what happens in the context of cancer-associated cachexia is the, the liver cannot function properly and is unable to produce ketones in of caloric restriction, which is exactly what happens in cachexia. And not just that, but it also affects hormones and, and it leads to immunosuppression and failure of immunotherapy. Um, another... Um, um, organ system that is affected, uh, sorry, another um, mm, part of the body that is affected is, just, is fat tissue. Um, uh, you might know that the fat, as adults, we call it white fat. Um, when we are born as very, and as very young children, our fat is called brown fat or brown adipose tissue. And this brown um, adipose tissue in early stages it's uh, used for, con for controlling and regulated body temperature. It um, produces heat and it helps maintain a uh, constant body temperature. But as we grow up and as we become adults, this brown adipose tissue is, um, is not there anymore and we have white adipose tissue. What has been observed in the context of cachexia is browning of adipose tissue, meaning that that fat that was supposed to be white, white adipose tissue in the context of, of, of adults is now going backwards and being converted in brown adipose tissue and releasing energy during this um, thermoregulation process. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting um, what cancer can do in different um, aspects of the body. And then there's the brain. Um, and uh, in, as part of the Janovitz lab, I mainly focus in brain research and mm, mm, the uh, nervous system um, and how the nervous system is affected by the host. Um, because as I, as I mentioned, as I did these rotations throughout the years, um, I, really, I really thought that the brain um, and the nervous system was the most interesting part for me. So I, when I met Tobias, I, I thought I would go into cancer research and then I was able to bring both together. So neuroscience, which is what I enjoyed before um, meeting him and then bringing it together with cancer because they interact and of course cancer affects the brain. Um, and why is that? Well, there's um, this, this uh, phenot phenotype I talked to you about um, that happens during cancer cachexia disturbs sleep pattern, um, the lack of food intake despite, despite and this lack of motiv motivation, anhedonia, not feeling like doing anything, I'm just tired all the time. And this is what uh, patients with, with cancer feel. So this somehow connects and relates to the brain, right? The brain must be must be saying um, to those people, this is not something we want to do. We are not motivating. What's what's going on? So um, my research focuses exactly on that. What is causing all these behavioral issues? 
And uh, for that, I, of course, look at the brain. And I'm just gonna show you a video of how the brain changes during cancer cachexia. I, by using a model we have in the lab to study cancer cachexia, we compared um, which areas of the brain are um, activated and not activated during cachexia. Um, what does it mean that they're activated and not activated? So you're gonna see that in red, um, the areas in red are going to be areas that are regulated. So that means that those areas are working more than they would normally work in a healthy um, person. And the areas in green are areas that are working less and therefore the neurons are doing less synapses and working less than they would normally do in the context of a, of a healthy um, individual. And as you can see, um, and as we go through the whole brain, this is just going through the brain from frontal to from the front to the back, there's many, many, many changes that um, occur during cancer cachexia. I'm just gonna um, wait for the video to go through all the way. It's not just a specific area in the brain that we could point to and say, oh, this is it. It's just lots, lots of changes. And as I said, in cachexia, this, the, people are not motivated and are lethargic. So I guess the first instinct would be to think, well, then it must be just a down regulation and, and um, a decrease of activity in general. But the truth is that when we really look at it, that's not true. There is some um, inactivation, but there is also an, a lot of activation in other areas. So I'm gonna go and focus on, on talking about some of them. For example, I should circle here this specific area in red um, that is called the nucleus of the solitary tract. And this area in the brain is in charge of regulation of the regulation of sleep um, and sensing all the, all the other um, um, cues happening in the, in the periphery of, of the body. Um, and as you can see, it appears to be um, are regulated in the context of cancer cachexia. Um, this is just a map of the, of the um, area of the brain and I'm just pointing to you the, the specific area. So it's regulated and that, would, that, that per makes perfect sense because patients that have cancer cachexia, they have these changes in the sleep pattern. They, they cannot sleep properly or they are very tired during the day. So there's the one would expect that there's something going on with um, the structure in charge of regulating sleep. Um, and another area of the brain that is quite interesting is reward. Because um, as I said, patients have this lack of motivation, this like not wanting to do anything. Um, these lethargy and anhedonia, and there's a specific circuitry of the brain in charge in charge of that, and this is the one I show you here that goes from the BTA or ventral tegmental area, and the neurons here secrete dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter of the brain, and that is used um, as a as a sort of message. Neurons here secrete dopamine that is sent here to another area, nucleus accumbens. Um, and dopamine is um, in charge of um, driving pathways involved in memory, in reward, um, and it's the cause of many, many physiological functions, but as well pathological, um, pathological avenues. So um, this is the areas I wanted to focus on to start the to study the reward secret circuitry of the brain, and this is just um, how dopamine is produced in the neurons in the BTA and then released into the um, to the nucleus accumbens area here. This is a tip of an axon, and as you can see, there's these tiny bags um, where dopamine is stored, and when dopamine needs to be decreased, these tiny bugs go into the front of the axon and is released and then detected by the neurons present in the nucleus accumbens. How that is, this is the way how reward is sent. So if there's dopamine being secreted from the, from the neurons in the BTA, 
conscious accumbens that's dopamine telling the brain, this is exciting, this is good, this is, we like this, we like doing this, we should keep doing this. Um, but of course, in patients that have cancer cachexia, this, this has to be malfunctioning because they, they don't feel that way. They don't find anything that they want to keep doing because it's enjoyable. Um, and when we look at the BTA, the area that I just mentioned um, here um, in, the, in the cachectic brain of our in vivo model, we see Adam regulation of the area. So the neurons in this area are working less, secreting less dopamine, and therefore there's no sensing of this reward and this feeling of, of, of happiness and, and of motivation. And we are trying to now uh, investigate how does this happen? Which, what is leading this um, inactivity of the neurons? Why are not neurons working properly? What is the tumor doing? Is the tumor sending any signal? How is that sent into the brain? Um, which is the signal that the tumor is sensing? Why is this happening? Um, and to do that, we need to go into into depth into the brain and really explore the areas of the brain, the cells in the brain, and not, not just only neurons, because in the brain there's neurons, but there's also these supportive cells that help the neurons uh, work properly. And uh, what I'm going to show you is just a video of how we can go into the brain in specific detail. I look in to the, to the cells um, and see which cells are there, which cells uh, have been um, increased in number. Are there some cells that are not, um, have changing shape, for example? Are these supportive cells not working anymore? And is that what is causing the neurons to malfunction, etc.? So this is just going into the brain um, with some stainings we do with um, tissue and checking what, how are the, the cells changing? Which uh, markers are these cells expressing? Um, are they changing their activity, etc.? cetera? Um, and this is what I'm currently doing. And hopefully I will be able to answer many of these questions that uh, occur during cancer progression and cancer cachexia. And my ideal plan would be to um, to find which is the um, sensor that comes from the tumor or what is the tumor doing that produces this lack of motivation in patients and how does the brain sense that and of course how can we avoid that and, and, and improve the patient's life and patient's behavior um, during um, this very dramatic pathology that is cancer. And I just want to show how um, the lab looks like, the team members of the Janowitz lab, and this is us. And of course, none of these would have been possible um, without the Tobias Janowitz and everyone in, in his lab. Uh, thank you for listening. This, is, this was all my, my talk.